<clears throat> All right, so here we are in Revelation chapter 19. Now, um, you know, just a brief overview. Revelation sometimes can be kind of confusing to people. Uh, it's, it's very prophetic. You know, future events are being prophesied here, and there's a lot of different theories. A lot of people teach different things, but um, it's it's. It's really not that difficult to understand. And we actually have, there's a couple of DVDs in the back. Um, there's one that's called After the Tribulation that gives a good timeline of when the, the rapture is going to occur. And then there's another one, there's a whole series called the Book of Revelation where there's, you know, just chapter by chapter is um, dissected and taught. And, and um, it's not me that's doing the teaching, it's Pastor Anderson that's in Tempe. But um, I agree with what he preaches and teaches, which is why we offer this stuff available here. That's a church that I went to before being sent out to start this one. So um, everything's free, of course. If you're interested in any of that, go ahead and, and pick that up on your way out. But what we see here in Revelation 19 is Jesus Christ uh, uh, coming with the saints on a white horse and they're coming to battle the, the wicked people of the earth. And this is basically at the end of, the, of God's wrath being poured out on the earth right when he's coming, Jesus Christ is coming to set up his thousand year reign on this earth. You see, after things get really bad, the Antichrist comes into power. Um, there's going to be persecution of the saints, and then Jesus Christ is going to come back. We're going to be caught up uh, together with him in the air, and he is going to, uh, you know, the world is going to be judged. And then when he actually sets up his kingdom, right, this is at the point then the, the beast and the false prophet are going to be um, thrown into that lake of fire. And the devil is going to be cast into hell. And then it says here, Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom and he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. So Jesus Christ is finally going to set up a kingdom here where he's going to be the king. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. And he's going to you know, rule over basically the whole world and show us how things should be. I believe it's going to be back to a time where it was like in the Garden of Eden. You know, prior to the sin of, of Eve and Adam and the fall of man, and, and kind of show us the way things God had originally intended for, for life to be on this, on this earth. And that's where you read scriptures about the, the lamb laying down with the lion, you know, and, and, a, and, a, and a child playing with, with a serpent and it's not going to hurt him, you know, and, and everything goes back to a, 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 a time of peace, right, with, without that, uh, that influence. I'm saying and Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning, so um, it's going to be the perfect government, it's going to be the perfect everything um, where, while he reigns on this earth. Now, um, anyway, that just give you a, a notion here of what this chapter is referring to, but that's not what I'm preaching on this morning. What I want to point out here is these, we see three different names that are given to the one riding the white horse, which we know based on the names to be Jesus Christ. We see the first one here in, chap in verse number 11. Verse number 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. So that's a name being ascribed to the person riding a horse. Right? Look at verse 13, the next name. It says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Right? Another name, the Word of God. And if you're familiar with John chapter 1, right? the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? So that's another same reference of the word being a name. 1 John 5 says, um, you know, and there are three in heaven that bear witness, the, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So the word is a name, of course, obviously ascribed to Jesus. In John chapter 1, it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. So, um, Again, this is obviously Jesus Christ, but that's another name given to him, the Word. And then in verse 16, it says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, the Bible says these are all names given. So what I want to point out real briefly is that you know, there, there's, there's one cult out there that, that calls themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you ever talk to these people, the one thing they want to focus on is, well, what's God's name? Well, do you even know what God's name is? And they get all caught up in this, what's God's name? And they say, God's name is Jehovah and that's his only name and we could only call him Jehovah. Look, we see right here Jesus Christ has, has three names. 
just right here in, 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 in a few verses of Scripture. The Bible says that, that God's name, yes, it's Jehovah, but how did he reveal himself unto Moses? He said, I am. I am. I am hath sent you. The Bible says, you know, calls his name Yah. It calls his name, you know, there's so, the Bible says, you know, God's name, whose name is Jealous. One of God's name is Jealous. And um, there, there's just, there's so many places where you see multiple names of God. So don't get caught up in this nonsense. If someone wants to, you know, try to tell you, oh, you don't even know what God's name is. Look, and, and I never let them get me steered off on that trail either. Because obviously, look, you know, I, it, it sounds silly and it's kind of funny. It's easy to poke fun at them. But when you talk to these people, you know, we ought to love them and try to get them saved. We want to try to, to get them into truth and not just get caught up in some debate or even worry about making them look stupid, but it's, it's what you want to do is to focus on the gospel and focus on salvation. So um, when they want to bring up God's name, I just say, yeah, yeah, you know, I, whatever. You know, I don't even get involved in that debate or that argument because what's more important is that they put their faith in Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, and that they don't believe in a works-based salvation. But we see right here, you know, three different names ascribed to Jesus Christ. And um, the one I want to focus on, though, is faithful and true. Now, I just want to briefly point out while we're looking at these names, because every name in the Bible has meaning. Every name has meaning. Um, starting even with Adam and Eve. Right? Eve was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. That's what Eve means, is that she was the mother. So every name, you know, God changed people's names many times. You remember um, Simon, the apostle, was renamed to Cephas, or Peter, which means a stone. Jesus Christ gave him that name. Abraham, Abram, his name was changed to Abraham. Right? Uh, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And all of those names have specific meanings. Well, we can't just overlook names. You know, people want to say, oh, yeah, that's just, you know, like the, when Jesus is called the Word, they'll say, oh, yeah, well, that's just a name, and it basically, like, it's meaningless. It's not meaningless. The Word of God, here, his name being called the Word of God is very important to understand because we have, for one, we have the Word of God, the written Word of God in our hands today. We have the complete written Word of God and what I'm going to tell you this morning is that this is Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. Now, I don't mean physically this book, right? We're not going to set this book up on an altar and like bow down to the book and the pages. But I do worship the Bible because Jesus Christ is the physical embodiment of the Word of God. The Bible says the Word was made flesh. So God's Word, God's spoken Word, God's Word is, is living and powerful and it was made flesh, and that's who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the Word. I mean, the Word is truth, right? God's Word is truth. Jesus Christ is truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. These words bring life. No, one, no man can be saved. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We need to have faith in order to be saved. You can't have that faith unless you hear the Word of God. You need God's Word to be saved just as much as you need Jesus Christ physically to have died and been buried and rise again from the dead. They're inseparable from each other. And it, it, it's kind of difficult to really wrap your mind around. But this is what the scripture teaches. And it uses names like the Word of God in order to help illustrate that truth to us that Jesus is the Word. He is the physical embodiment of God's Word. And just as much as Jesus Christ was without sin and had no error, had no contradiction, was completely perfect, was God in the flesh, God's Word is completely perfect and without error and is completely trustworthy. I mean, think about how much you can trust Jesus Christ. You could trust Him with your soul, right? I mean, that's what we need to do in order to be saved. We're trusting Him with our soul to save us from hell and to bring us to heaven when we die. We are trusting Him with everything. We have a, the Word of God that we can trust just as completely and, and, and 
100% as we do on Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the Word. And God's the one who promised to preserve His Word throughout all time. You have a lot of people that want to cast doubt on God's Word and try to get you to believe that, that oh, well, there's mistakes and errors and, you know, there's been all these translations and people have, have you know, been made copies and copies and there's all, you know, there's just errors and mistakes and you can't really believe everything that it says to be 100% true, the Word of God. But God is the one who promised to preserve His Word. I believe God at His promise. God is faithful. And this is, this is what I'm going to be preaching on this, on this morning. The title of my message is, The Lord is Faithful and True. God is faithful. We can trust God. We can trust His words. And just to illustrate this real briefly, we're in, we're in Revelation 19. Flip over to Revelation 21. Remember, Jesus Christ's name was called faithful and true in Revelation 19. Look at verse number 5 of Revelation 21. The Bible says, and he, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Jesus Christ's name was faithful and true. He says, These words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And then in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 6, the Bible reads, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So Jesus Christ, his name is the Word, the Word of God. He is faithful and true. And then in two places here in Revelation, the Bible says that his words or his sayings are faithful and true equating the, the, the two together with Jesus Christ and the Word of God and the words of God, these sayings being faithful and true just as much as Jesus is, Christ, is, is faithful and true. So why is it so important that Jesus is named faithful? And that His words are faithful. Because faithful means that they are sure, that we, they, they are trustworthy, they are definite, there's no doubt and no question about them. <coughs> God is a faithful God. We can trust Him with every, everything that the Bible says, every promise that God has ever made. God is true to His Word. You know, we live in a world today where a lot of people aren't true to their Word. They'll say things and it doesn't really mean much. You don't know who you can trust, right? But God, we know 100% we can trust. God is not going to say something to deceive you. God is not going to say something to try to trick you or something that's not true. God cannot lie. The Bible says that it is impossible for God to lie because he's holy, because he's perfect. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, you could turn there if you like, Deuteronomy chapter 7, the fifth book of the Bible in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to see God's word unto the children of Israel. And he's explaining his covenant with them and that he is true to his word. So he's, he lays out his commandments and he lays out his law and he's telling them, look, I need you to listen to me and believe me because, he, because he's true. What he's saying is true and he's faithful to his word. If God makes a promise, no matter how hard that is, God keeps his promise. We think about uh, Abraham. God promised him a son, didn't he? He promised a son to be born. He promised Abraham that his seed was going to be like the multitude of like the stars in the heaven and the sand that's upon the seashore. He promised Abraham a great multitude. But Abraham was 100 years old before finally Isaac was born. And that's a long time. And in, in, in our minds, that's the impossible. You'd think, well... God's not going to keep his promise. You know, he might be doubt, and he did doubt. And that's why he, he went in unto his handmaid, unto Hagar, and Ishmael was born. Because he doubted. He didn't have that full faith and confidence that God was going to actually come through with his promise. And he had a lapse in faith. But God's able to do what if God said it to happen. He's like, I don't care that you're 100 years old. I don't care that Sarah is 90 years old and way past the age of giving birth to children. To God, that doesn't matter. He says, I made a promise, and you know what? I keep my promises. Because what God says is sure and faithful and true. Deuteronomy 7, let's look, start reading here in verse number 7. The Bible reads, The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were 
the fewest of all people. So God's explaining here, you know, when he chose out Israel, he said, you know, when I chose you out to be the people who are going to, you know, carry the torch and, and be that light shining in a dark world, and I was going to reveal myself unto you for you to reveal myself unto the world. And he says, I didn't set my love upon you and choose you because you were this great nation and because you were already, you know, what everybody looked up to. He says, no, you were the least of all people. And that's who God likes to use. God likes to find the weak and the poor and, and, and the people who are, who are looked at as despised and, and the least likely to, to be anything in the world's eyes. God loves taking those people and exalting them. And this is what he did with his nation of Israel. They were the fewest number. They were a small, small group. But God multiplied them. Right? And, and God blessed them. But he says in verse 8, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He's bringing up the fact, hey, God made a promise all those you know, hundreds of years ago unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, God keeps his promises, which is why he brought you forth out of Egypt. Because God is a God that knows his word. He remembers where he's faithful and true unto his words. Verse number nine, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. He's a faithful God. He's true to what he says. He keeps his covenant. When God makes a promise or a covenant with you, God is sure to keep that promise. He goes on here in verse 10, and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And he goes on in this chapter to continue with all the blessings that they'll receive if they would just follow his commandments and listen to his words and do what he has to, to tell them. Now, of course, we know that the children of Israel did not keep that old covenant and they ended up being judged. But see, God was true to his word. And he said any time that the children of Israel came back to God and they would serve him with a full heart, hey, he would bless them. He would, he would keep them safe from their enemies. He would deliver them out of the, out of the hands of the people that would do them harm. But when they turned their back on him, when they went and, and served other gods, God would judge them. But see, this was the covenant that he made with them. You've heard of the old covenant and the new covenant, right? There's two covenants that God made. The old covenant was of the law. That was the old arrangement, the old deal was that, hey, okay, here's my law and I expect you, I want you to follow all of my, all of my law and then everything will be good with you and, and I'll bless you. And the problem with that covenant was that the people aren't able to keep that covenant. I mean, just as much today as we're not able to, they weren't able to back then. We are not able to keep all of God's law. We all fall short, which is why we need grace. And the new covenant was ushered in with Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. The gospel of Jesus Christ brought in that new covenant, that new agreement of, of faith. Now, that was what's carried out. Of course, people have always been saved by grace through faith in the Bible, all throughout the Bible. Romans chapter 4, if you're, if you're not sure about that, read Romans chapter 4. The Bible talks about Abraham and it talks about David believing God and it was counted unto them for righteousness. That, that, that is where they believed on God and, and that's how they got saved. That's how they receive eternal life just as much as we do today because people are the same. They weren't able to keep the law any better back then than we are today. I mean, think about how you match up with God's law. And, and how perfect do you think you are when it comes to that? Well, they were the same way. 
And we have evidence of it in the Bible. No one was able to keep that law, that covenant. But God says, and this is true, hey, if there is somebody that's able to keep all the commandments and all the covenant of God, guess what? They will be blessed. They'll have eternal life and everything else. But we all fall short. We break that covenant with God. So it's not God that is unfaithful to his covenant when we break it, right? He's there to keep his end of the deal. But the new covenant is, is great because it's, it's a lot easier because he only requires faith in Jesus Christ for us to be saved. And um, <coughs> that's a one-time thing, but we'll be getting to that in just a minute. I'll read this for you. Turn, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 3. In Psalm 119, the Bible says in verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. God is a faithful God. He's someone that we could rely on, and God's faithfulness goes to all generations. It's not just for a specific time period or just for a specific group of people like the children of Israel. God is faithful in his entirety to everybody, and his words apply to everybody. Praise God for his faithfulness. When we live in such a world where you don't know who you can trust, I was bringing this up earlier, you know, a lot of people are deceitful, and we don't know who we can turn to. God is trustworthy, and we can trust everything that he says. The Bible says in Romans 3, verse 3, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So what he's saying is, you know, hey, God's been preached unto the children of Israel. And what happens if some of those people don't believe in him? Does that mean that God isn't faithful because they didn't believe him? Verse 4 says, God forbid. Yea, let God be true. But every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Hey, every man can be a liar. If they don't believe, that doesn't mean that what God's word is saying isn't true just because people don't believe it, right? If I were to tell you something that's completely true and factual, it doesn't all of a sudden make that statement a lie just because nobody happens to believe it, right? And that's basically what it's saying here. Hey, look, God, let God be true. What he says is true. Just because people don't believe him, and if it's the majority of people that don't believe him, like it is today, the majority of people in the world don't believe on Jesus Christ. That's just a fact. I mean, there's some, what, 7 billion people in the world today? The, the vast majority of those people do not believe on Jesus Christ. But just because you say, oh, well, the majority, it's not like the majority just wins in what's true. Usually the majority is wrong. Usually you know, what, what most people want to do or, or think is right is usually wrong. It's kind of funny the way it works out that way. But God is true even if nobody believed him. Even if everybody disagreed with God, God is true. That's why the Bible says, let God be true but every man a liar. You see, Satan doesn't want you trusting the Lord. And this is why he uses his tactics of trying to put doubt in your minds. We know from the Bible, we know even through experience that we could trust God. We could trust the Lord. He is faithful. But see, the devil wants you to think that he's not so faithful. Or he at least wants you to cause doubt in your minds. He caused doubt in, in the mind of, of Abraham. You know, he uses many different tactics to do this. A, a big one of the, of the tactics he uses to put doubt in people's mind is the modern Bible perversions. This is why I brought up earlier, you know, Jesus Christ is the word. We have a perfect, preserved word of God today that we can trust without any doubts. But see, I believe Satan is behind all the new modern Bible versions, the NIV and the ESV and all these other different, you know, there's, you go to a Bible bookstore and you just see like, well, which Bible do you want? And most people are like, I have no idea. I didn't even know there were a choice. Like, like most people just think that the Bible is the Bible, right? And that, and because why wouldn't you, why would you think anything else? Like the Bible is the Bible, just like you pick up any other book and that's what it is. But Satan's out there to try to confuse people. The devil is the author of confusion. He's the one who wants people to not know what the truth is, not know what's going on. So it makes sense that, hey, Here's 400 different versions of the Bible. Good luck trying to find the right one. 
He tries to make it so you have to find a needle in a haystack. That's one of his tactics. And people will look at this and be like, well, how do I know what's true? This book, this one says this and that one says that. And they all say different things. This one doesn't have any, you know, these verses. This one does have these verses. This one has extra stuff, you know, and it makes things really confusing. But that's not the way that God designed it. That's not the way that God intended. God has kept true and faithful to his promise to keep his words from generation to generation. Throughout all generations. The Bible says in, um, in Psalm 12, verse number 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's job is to preserve his word from, you know, from this generation, from, from the time that these words were being spoken under the, the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit all the way in forever. God is responsible for preserving his word. And God is faithful and true. We could believe that. Yes, God has kept his words for us. If his word is so critical and so important that you need the word of God to be saved. Don't you think that he would make sure he kept his word around for us today? I do. I don't think it's that hard to believe. God wants unity in the church. We, re we read that already in 1 Corinthians. We see that God wants us all believing the same thing. He wants us believing in the truth. The only way he's going to make sure that we could be believing the same thing is by having his word and one, you know, one Bible, one word to look at in order to get all of our information, all of our source of truth and knowledge from. That only makes sense. But no, the devil comes along and he, and he starts giving all these different versions saying, oh, well, we found this scroll in a garbage can somewhere. And literally, there's manuscripts that, that, that these new versions are based on from, from manuscripts that were thrown in a trash can found in the Vatican. And, that's, and that was a source that made its way into these modern Bible versions that say something different than what's been accepted throughout history as being Scripture by the churches. But I'm not going to get into all of that uh, this morning. There's, there's plenty of information about the, the, why we use the King James Bible, why we believe it's the preserved Word of God. But another tactic that Satan uses besides all these different Bible versions is, you know, people, he wants to cause doubt in your mind and try to get you to, you know, maybe foolishly blame God for all the bad things that happen. Uh, I, 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 all too frequently, I, I'll talk to people out soul winning and trying to, trying to convince them and show them why, you know, Jesus is a Savior, why they need to believe this. And then people say, well, if, you know, if God's real, then why, why are all these bad things happening? And I don't want to serve God because he caused this to happen in my life. You know, it's like, God's not the one doing that. And people have to realize that, Again, it could be Satan attacking you. It could be some other evil person doing that to you. You know, we can't just throw all the blame on God and just assume that God's the one that's doing all these things because he's not. There's many things that, that the devil will try to do to get you to shake your faith in God and get you to start to doubt and question, well, wait, is God really real? Is God true? You know, can I believe God when he says these things? But we can be assured that God is faithful. And I'm thankful that we have a faithful God, that we can believe wholeheartedly in everything that he tells us. And um, one of the ways that God is faithful, he tells us, and for, you don't have to turn it. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 1 in the New Testament. Titus chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. This is a great, a great encouragement to understand that even when you are going through what seems, you know, the worst time in your life, the worst temptations and trials and things that are happening that are difficult for you to go through, he says, it will never get too bad. That he said, God's, God is going to make a way 
for you to be able to escape that temptation before it gets to the point where you can't bear it, where you can't take it anymore. He says, God will make it, you know, he says, he's not going to allow you to be tempted above that you're able to withstand. There's a lot of hard trials that come in our lives. But, but we can at least take comfort in the fact that no matter how bad it gets, we can trust God that when he says, you know, when we see verses like this in the Bible, that he will remain faithful to that. To where we can know that, you know what, I will make it through whatever comes my way. I will make it through because God will not allow me to face something I can't handle. You may feel like you can't handle things at times. But God will make sure that you can make it through. And, and whatever you can't handle, he's going to make a way for you to escape and to not have to go through that. My last point, and it's, and it's actually a major point to this sermon, on the faithfulness of God, is the fact that our eternal life is sure. The eternal life that God has given to us, it is a fact, it is sure. We can have confidence and no doubt whatsoever about our own salvation that once we are saved, we are saved forever. That once God saves our soul, He remains faithful to this promise. I, I, I had you turn to uh, Titus chapter 1, verse number 2. The Bible says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has made a promise of giving unto us eternal life. Eternal means forever. He made a promise. Hey, if God promises you eternal life, you can trust God's not going to go back on that promise. God's not going to say, oh yeah, I was just kidding. I take that back. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. The book of 1 John was written, all those words were written. He says, look, I've written this to you so that you can believe on the name, unto you that believe. Those of you that are believers, he says, I've written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. You need to understand this and know. You can know for a fact you have eternal life. I know I have eternal life today. Why? Because God promised it. God's promise, His covenant is whosoever believeth. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's a promise. You believe. This is the, the one condition to your eternal salvation. The condition is believing. The condition is putting your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you have met that condition, it's a promise. He says, here you go, eternal life. It's yours. My favorite verse in the old Bible is John 5, 24. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus Christ, do you believe that he's faithful to his words or not? When he says you shall not come into condemnation, you've already passed from death unto life. Is what he said true or is it a lie? Is there some other thing that can come up after Jesus already said that where all of a sudden you don't have eternal life anymore? Turn, if you would, to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. This is, this is an excellent chapter, and this will, will hopefully answer any doubts that you might have and bring up situations where people say, well, what about this and what about that? And, you know, and everyone always wants to say, well, you can't just go and do whatever you want. You can't just you know, live a life, and you can't just sin, and you can't just do all these other things and still expect to be saved, can you? Well, yeah, if eternal life is a free gift, if God's giving it to you for free, and the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. If salvation is not based on our good works, then how is he going to take it away because of our bad works? Doesn't make any sense. Psalm 89 is going to shed a lot of light on this subject and the faithfulness of God. Psalm 89, verse number 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Great start to this psalm of the joy, of the mercies, of singing about the, the mercies of God forever. He says, I'm going to make known, I'm going to make sure people understand your faithfulness, O Lord, 
to all generations. Verse 2, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Now we're going to see him referring to Jesus Christ. He's, he's prophesying of the Holy One to come. Look at verse number 4. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations, Selah, and the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? <coughs> Jump down, if you would, to verse 18. The Bible says, For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. So here we're talking about now the Holy One. So about Jesus Christ is the Holy One of Israel. He is our King. The Lord is our defense. Verse 19, Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One, and saidst, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Of course, Jesus Christ is the exalted one. He's the chosen one out of all the people to be lifted up. I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. Now you notice multiple times where the Bible refers to David. It's not, it's not referring specifically to, to David, but the, the seed that would come of the loins of David to Jesus Christ, who is a descendant of David. Verse uh, 22, The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness aff afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn. Jesus Christ is the first begotten of the dead. Jesus Christ is the firstborn. I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Standing fast with him means it's, it's going to be sure. My covenant is going to remain with him. Look at verse number 29. His seed also will I make to endure forever. His seed. His seed. Now, did Jesus Christ have any physical children? No. Jesus Christ didn't have a wife. Jesus Christ didn't commit fornication. Jesus Christ was without sin. He didn't have any physical children. But he does have spiritual children. Right? The Bible said Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3 that we must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. We're born of the word of God. We're born of Jesus Christ. When we are born again, we become a child of God. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, the Bible says in John chapter 1. This is referring to people who are believers in Jesus Christ, his children, his seed, those of us that are born again. He says, also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. But let's keep reading. I want to make sure that that's clear, that, that, that that's proven. You can see that from the scripture that his seed is referring to us, to his believers, those that are born again. Verse number 30, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments. What does that mean? If his children, if his seed, if those that believe on him, if those are born again, forsake God's law and say, you know, I don't have anything to do with God's law. I'm going to forsake, I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't care about God's law and walk not in my judgments. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, <clears throat> Look at this. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. He's saying, well, guess what? They're going to get a beating. If you disobey me, if you disobey God, what he's saying is I'm going to bring the rod. I'm going to set things straight. You're going to get a punishment. But he continues. He doesn't stop there. Because someone might say, oh, yeah, see, that means he's going to cast them into hell because that's where they're going to be punished. 
No. We are punished in this lifetime from God after we're saved and we break His laws and commandments and forsake His judgments. Verse number 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from Him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. He's saying, I'm not going to completely remove my loving kindness towards that person. Now, if someone's sent to hell, wouldn't you say that God's loving kindness is just completely removed from that person? I mean, they're just going through torture and torment 24-7. They have no rest day nor night. And, and there is nothing good in their future whatsoever. I think God has removed his loving kindness from those people that are burning in hell. But these people, his seed, those that are born again, he says, I will not completely remove my loving kindness from them nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. See, God's faithfulness can't fail. He has to be true to his word. And if he makes a promise, like we saw already in Titus chapter 1, he's promised eternal life. He has to keep that promise. Even if we are really bad children and disobey God every step of the way, if we're born into his family, we're born again, and he's given to us eternal life like he promised he can't go back on his word and just take that away because he's upset with us because we're not doing what he wants us to do. He will remain true to his promise. It may be a hard thing for us to realize today. You know, it's, it's an easy analogy. You think of, of a relationship of a marriage. And all too often today, people will get a divorce, and, and I understand why, but when one spouse is unfaithful, when they do not keep themselves holy to that other person like they promised to do, I mean, when you get married, you make vows to each other. You're making promises. You're saying, look, I am yours and you are mine and we are here for each other. We're not going to go to anybody else. When times are good, when times are bad, we are going to stick together. This is the vow we're making. We're promising that. Now, you make those promises independently, individually, and you don't put conditions on them. Well, unless you do this and this and this and this and this, then I won't be faithful to you. No, the, the, or the Bible, no. The, the vows are, are usually somewhere along the lines of, you know, it, it, for better, for worse, you know, in sickness and in health and poverty and in wealth and in oh, all these different situations, whatever comes up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there for you. And you make that commitment that, it, that has a lot of meaning. It ought to have a lot of meaning. It doesn't seem to have meaning these days. People just seem to be reciting words without their heart being in it. But a marriage, when you get married to somebody, your heart ought to be in it. But we, you, know, you think of something, well, if my spouse were to do this, then I, I'd just have to, I'm going to divorce them. God doesn't do that. When God makes a promise or a vow, and you know, we're referred to, the believers are referred to as the bride of Christ. Right? There's a reference, and we're going to see that in a little bit. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I wanted to cover this right now. I think it's, it's pertinent with where we're at. Believers are going to be referred to as the bride of Christ. And we're adorned and, and ready for our, for our husband, you know, Jesus, to come and to um, bring us to that marriage supper of the Lamb. And... We know that we're not perfect. We do things to anger God. We break God's laws. But you know what? God is perfect. And you could say, well, how could someone who's already perfect, I mean, wouldn't he expect that out of us? Yeah, he does expect that out of us. But once he makes a promise, he doesn't go back on it. Now, you could say in your marriage, well, I've been faithful. I've been true. I've done all of these things for my spouse. I have done all of this. If I can do it, then why can't they? Right? And you expect people to do the same thing. And there's nothing wrong with that expectation. But when you use that as your reasoning to break your promise, well, now you've just gone back on your word and you can no longer say that you're faithful when you break your promise. You know, how, can, how can I trust you at your word once you break your word, once you break your vow, once you break what you've said you're going to do? But God is faithful. Even when we do the things that he would never do and treat the Lord 
in, in a disrespectful way, in a way that's not loving, in a way that's not good, when He does so much for us, He'll never leave us or forsake us. So when He says that His faithfulness will not fail, God is faithful. When God makes that promise, we, he, is, he is true to his word. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. When God says something, it is true and sure. You know, sometimes we get ourselves in trouble. You say something, you don't quite mean it. And then you want to go back and change the things that you said. And, you know, I get it. Look, it's happened to me. It's probably happened to everybody. But when something, when words go forth from the mouth of God, he says it's not, there's no taking it back. It's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. He says he's not going to change it. He's not going to alter it and say, oh, well, now you did this, so I'm going to change my words. Nope. If God said something, he remains true to it. Verse 35, once have I sworn by my, in, by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me if God says look I don't care if they break my statutes if they break my covenants if they do all this stuff hey I'm going to visit them with the rod but you know what when I said they have eternal life it's eternal that means forever and I will not change what I said and what I promised just because they've gone out and done things that are bad I'm going to discipline them but I will not utterly remove my loving kindness from them. This is back in the Old Testament. Psalm 89. We find this same truth in the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I get this question sometimes when I try to explain salvation and just explain the freeness of it and explain how it's eternal life and that you can't lose that salvation and that all God requires of us is to put our faith in Him. And once we do that, the moment we, with all of our heart, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive eternal life. Once we do that, we are born again. We're born into God's family. And as I explain that, sometimes people will say, well, what if you stop believing? And that, that question makes sense because you say, okay, well, you know, you need to believe in order to be saved. So then what happens if you don't believe? Does that mean you're no longer saved? Well, let's see what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 11. The Bible says, it is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Look at this, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Even if we stop believing, God still remains faithful. God still remains true. Ephesians chapter 1, turn there if you'd, if you'd like. This is, this is a verse that we have printed on our, on our invitations. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. The Bible reads, In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We're talking about God's faithfulness today and that God doesn't go back on His Word. He doesn't change His Word. And when God makes a promise, it's true. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Now, I understand this verse is kind of worded in a way. It's a little bit more difficult to understand. You're going to have to probably read it a few times to get the meaning. But basically what he's saying is that, look, after you heard the gospel, and you believed the gospel, at that moment you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The moment you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Ghost resides inside of you. And He seals you. Just like in the old times they used to have you know, parchments or books or whatever, and they would seal the books and they would close them. And it's, that was meant to only be opened by the person it was intended for, right? And if that seal was broken, you know that it's been tampered with. Well, God seals us. 
No one else can get to us. We belong unto God. We're the purchased possession of God since he paid for us with the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says that, that spirit that we receive, that Holy Spirit, it's the earnest of our inheritance. Because now we've become children. Now we've become heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Inheritance is given to those in this world by of the descendants of the people who have deceased, right? I mean, if my, when my parents are, uh, uh, pass away, whatever they have, their estate, whatever kind of money they have, usually there's an inheritance that's, that's being given then unto their children. And I don't get that because, uh, you know, of anything I've done. I've just been born into that and, you know, received that inheritance as a result of being a uh, blood relative. And um, what we receive when we're born again is an inheritance that God has for us. The inheritance of her life, it, it, inheritance in heaven, the mansion that God has created for us in heaven. We have this inheritance. And he says that that Holy Spirit is the earnest of that. So when you go to buy a house, you have to put down earnest money, right? That earnest money means I am serious. I'm putting an offer. I want to buy this and I'm going to put this money down here. And even if the deal doesn't go through, that money belongs to that person because I am so serious. I'm just going to put this money down so that you know that I fully, completely, 100% intend on fulfilling this purchase, right? That's why you have earnest money, because you don't want people saying, yeah, I want to buy that, I'm going to buy you. And you say all the things that you want to buy something, and then you just, back, you know, and, and the other people are like, great, we have someone that's willing to buy it, and then it's back out. The earnest money is there to make it more concrete and legitimate. You say, okay, well, I put $10,000 down on this as earnest money. You know, I'm not going to just walk away from that. And it, it kind of makes that as like, you know, that, that intention. So what God is saying, hey, you've gotten that Holy Spirit, a promise that's the earnest because of the fact that when you get saved your soul is saved right your spirit is saved the moment you put your faith on Jesus but our flesh isn't saved yet we still have a sinful body and a sinful flesh God is going to give us a new body the the the, the salvation of us completely will take place when Jesus Christ comes back and we receive a new body with our soul and spirit but until that time, he says, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So until God comes and redeems us fully with, with our new bodies and everything, he says, I've given you the, the earnest of the Spirit. Turn if you would to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to close with this. Last verse we're going to look at. 1 John chapter 5. Just ask yourself, do you truly believe that God is faithful to his word and keeps his promises? He makes a lot of promises in the Bible. He makes promises on, on you know, ask and you shall receive. He talked about, you know, with prayer, as I mentioned earlier, um, going through the announcements. God makes lots of, of promises to us. But do you really believe that to be true when you read these things? We ought to. There should be no reason to doubt God's word. Because he is faithful and true. If God says something, hey, praise the Lord, we could read and look at the Bible and see what he says. And if God makes a promise, praise God, he's going to keep that promise. And we don't even have to doubt about it. Many people will claim that they do believe God's word to be true and faithful and that we could trust everything that God says. But then they'll turn around and they'll say that you could lose your salvation. Now, I think we've seen enough scripture this morning to demonstrate that you can't lose your salvation. It's a promise from God. It's eternal life. And that's what I was trying to do. You know, we see Psalm 89. We see all these other passages. And this isn't all of them. Believe me, this is not all of the, the, the scriptural references that will explain that you can't lose your salvation, that it's eternal, that it's simply by grace through faith. But how can you say that what God says is true and you read verses like John 3.16 and John 3.18 and all these verses that say all you have to do is believe and you have eternal life and John 5.24 where Jesus says you shall not come into condemnation. How can you sit there and say that everything that God said is true but then still believe that you can lose your salvation? It's a contradiction. My friends, anyone that believes that you can lose your salvation is making God a liar. And we're going to see that from 1 John chapter 5. 
1 John chapter 5. Look at verse number 10. Very simple verse. The Bible says in verse number 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. So the moment you believe, and we already saw this, right? You get the Holy Spirit. It's the earnest of our inheritance. Hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So you're saying, basically, if I were to tell you something, you say, well, I don't believe you. What are you essentially saying? You're saying, well, you're lying, right? When you say you don't believe something, you're calling that person a liar. And the Bible's saying right here, he's saying, look, if you don't believe the record that God gave of his son, you're making God a liar. People don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're calling God a liar. Because God has, has given it to us. He's told us. He said, look, this is what happened. This is what you need to do to be saved. And if you don't believe that, you're making him a liar. But he tells us then in the next verse, well, what is the record? What is it that we have to believe? And if we don't believe this, we are making God a liar. This is the record, verse 11, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. That's a very simple sentence, but there's three points in this one small verse that we have to believe because it's the record. Number one, God hath given to us. He's given it to us. It's a gift. It's something that is, that is given. It's not earned. Right? The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's, it's given. It's not deserved or earned or warranted based on your merits. It is given. It's eternal life. Now, <laughs> we have to believe it's eternal life. The word eternal means forever. It means it never ends. Either God has given us life that never ends, or he didn't. I mean, you can't have it. Well, you have eternal life, but then you don't, because as soon as you lose that salvation and lose eternal life, well, you could never have said it was eternal at any point that you had it because it didn't last forever. If you have something that doesn't last forever, that's not eternal. If I, have, if I could say, well, I have an eternal life today, but if I go out and murder someone tomorrow, I'm going to hell, that's not eternal life. It's not. It's conditional temporary life. It's not eternal life. In order for it to be eternal, it has to last forever. And then the third thing is that this life is in his son. It has to be through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the only way. You can't get, you can't get this life, this eternal life, any other way. So people, if you believe even one of these things isn't true, you're making God a liar. I mean, the people, some people might think that, hey, you know what? There's nothing I can do to earn it. It's a free gift, and it's eternal. It's going to last forever, but it's through Muhammad, or it's through somebody else. They're making God a liar. No, because it's through Jesus Christ, because it's through him. That's the only way. Or people say that, uh, you know, I believe that it's eternal life, it lasts forever, and it's through Jesus, but it wasn't given unto me. I, I earned it. I worked for it. I went to church enough. I helped enough people out. You're making God a liar. No, it's given to you. It's free. The same thing with eternal life. If you don't believe that it lasts forever, you're making God a liar. I mean, this is the record that God gave. This is the record that you have to believe in order to be saved. Praise God, He's a faithful and true God. No matter how bad we might be or the things that we might do, the sins that we might commit, when you're saved... God remains faithful to you. Just as any good father will. Now again, in this earth, we have wicked people. We have people who are not up to, living up to the way that they should be. But I know in my family, with my children, no matter what they do, I am always going to love my children. I'm going to be there for them. Always. Because I love them. And because they're my children, they're born into my family. There's a special relationship that I have with them that I don't have with anybody else, that my children specifically have that, that um, relationship. Now, if they break my commandments and do bad things and disobey everything I say, as the Bible says God will do, the rod's coming. They're going to be disciplined but I'm not going to completely cast my love out for them and remove my loving kindness from them. They're going to get the punishment that they deserve and they need 
to, to, to learn and to do what's right, but it's not like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast them into my oven and turn it on broil and just leave them in there. It's not going to happen. I'm going to remain faithful to them just as much as God remains faithful to us as his children. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being faithful and true and, and being the, the one person in our life that we can completely, 100%, without any doubts, trust in, dear Lord. Um, we know that when you say things, they do come to pass. We know that's how all of your prophets have, have been identified as being a prophet of the Lord because the things that they said came to pass. The things that you prophesied have come true. We know that they were prophets in speaking your word because all of your words come to pass, dear Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for treating us as your children, dear Lord, and that we don't have to doubt and worry about our own salvation because you've given it to us as a free gift, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to strive to do what's right and to show our respect and our love for you by obeying your commandments and doing the things that are right, dear God. But we, we, we really do thank you for um, just knowing and giving us the assurance and the comfort that you will never leave us or forsake us. You will never turn your back on us, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.